Continuing our conversation, it is a privilege to get to speak to the aforementioned former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull. He served as Prime Minister of Australia from 2015 to 2018. Thank you so much for being with us. Your comments were heard around the world. I woke up to them on, on Morning Joe, and I've seen them everywhere. Well, well, uh, look, it's a, it, I think it's a very important point to make. Uh, the, the, the Trump fascination with Putin is, is a very creepy one, and, and it was palpable. I mean, people who have been with Trump and Putin, and indeed people who saw him with Putin at that Helsinki conference will see the same thing. Uh, he, he has a fascination with Putin. He's in awe of Putin, probably admires him, probably wishes he could be as... Uh, omnipotent uh, in the America as Putin is in Russia, but uh, it's a very it's very disconcerting when you see the leader of the free world uh, being so interested in tyrants. And of course, it's not just Putin. I mean, look at his bromance with uh, Kim Jong Un. How how improbable was that? You know, effectively exchanging what I think he described as love letters. I think it is alleged to be among the classified things he took with him to Mar-a-Lago to hang on to them. And I understand he has framed pictures of himself with Kim Jong-un, which is, it's, it's, it's so bizarre. It sometimes falls off the radar of the things we talk about, but it should be top of mind. Um, I, I want to ask you what the conversation was among world leaders when you saw Trump fawn over Putin and Kim Jong-un. It... Look, this was particularly the case at the Hamburg G20 in 2017. It was very disconcerting. I mean, you saw on the one hand uh, Trump's uh, very, very apparent distaste for Angela Merkel, the Chancellor, you know, effectively the Prime Minister of Germany. On the other hand, his fascination with Putin. And it, it was an extraordinary contrast. Uh, so the, you know, his, I mean, his instincts are not democratic. I mean, I mean try, and, and again, he, he says the quiet part out loud, as you said in your introduction. You know, we don't have to, you know, speculate or psychoanalyse Donald Trump. He says all this stuff. Um, he is not a conservative. You know, people, people often talk about conservative, conservatism and so forth. Trump's not a conservative. Conservatives believe in the rule of law. They defend established institutions. You know, they, they, they are not, conservatives do not embrace radical change. They want change to be incremental and gradual. Uh, Trump is determined to use every lever he can get, and he says he will do that, to maximise his power and, of course, uh, you know, take action against his enemies. I mean, didn't he say it a bit mm -hmm. of public speech? Uh, mm -hmm. I will be your retribution. Well, you know, that's hardly the uh, that's hardly the language of someone who wants to bring everybody together. You see, I've always believed the, the role of a national leader is to unite their nation, their country, their community, to bring people together. Now, what Trump does and what and, and of course, Viktor Orban, who he's also fascinated with, as you said, does the same thing in Hungary. What he does, what his goal is, is to divide, take advantage of those divisions, and then use that to, you know, rile up uh, his supporters, you know, so that he can get enough support to win. And it's this, you know, this is supported by the right-wing media in America, particularly Fox News, what what I call angertainment. Uh, and it, mm. you know, it, it's it's doing unbelievable damage to your country. I mean, you, you live there; you know what it's like. The problem yes. for the rest of us: we all have a, we all have a stake in your election, but we don't have a say in it. Let, let me ask you this: I, I mean, America benefits from intelligence sharing agreements with with countries like yours. The Five Eyes all share. Um, threat information. And so the intelligence product that an American president sees may be a compilation of things that intelligence professionals from myriad nations have risked their lives um, to present to an American president for policymaking and to protect the country. What happens if the American president becomes someone who is not a democratic leader, who's someone that is um, on their way to being an autocrat? Could you imagine countries being 
reluctant to share their intelligence with our country? Well, you, well, you could. Uh, I think it's, uh, you know, puts enormous stress on relationships. Uh, you know, the very good friend of mine, David Petraeus, uh, has often observed uh, the only thing worse than fighting a war with allies is fighting a war without one, without allies. So, you know, the reality is the United States, unlike China and Russia, has a broad range of alliances, you know, NATO being... I guess, the largest and most important one. Um, when Trump was president in his first term, he sought to unsettle all those. You know, he, he pulled out of some very important global agreements, the climate agreement, for example. He didn't wouldn't participate in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Happily, Shinzo Abe and I were able to, to keep that going without the US. Uh, but with NATO, which is the single most important in a military strategic alliance, the American America is part of, he has threatened to pull out of that. And his fascination with Putin, who, of course, is the adversary, uh, really puts in question the viability of NATO. Now, this is, you know, the, the, the problem with that, with these arrangements, is that once you undermine the trust in them, the language, that doesn't make, you don't have to amend Article 5 of the NATO agreement. But once people feel that the United States cannot be counted on, is not consistent, uh, and Trump seek, if Trump actively seeks to undermine that confidence, then all sorts of terrible consequences can ensue. Dictators are encouraged. Countries that had been allies and friends of the United States, say like Japan, for example, uh, moving to the Pacific, may decide, well, the only way we can secure our future is to acquire our own nuclear capability. So you run the risk of nuclear proliferation. I mean, it is this disruptive, uh, chaotic approach that Trump takes to established alliances is a real threat to the security of the free world, the security of the United States, and, of course, particularly the security of America's close friends, like like Australia, and America has no better friend than Australia. But you know, we we have to look at it from our point of view. Is is Trump? I mean, is Trump's America, go, Mark II, going to be one that we can rely on? And the truth is, we can't be sure. You know, we really can't be sure. We can cross our fingers and hope that all will go well. But you can't be sure because this is a guy who seeks, he's not a conservative. He doesn't believe in continuity. He doesn't believe in consistency. He's in a sense a, a sort of a, a revolutionary in that respect. But it's a chaotic populist way of disrupting the world. And I don't see that there is any satisfactory outcome of that except advantaging our autocratic rivals. Are you aware of conversations um, among world leaders to figure out what to do, to figure out what to do with agreements and partnerships? Should <clears throat> Trump win a second term? Well, everybody is hedging. I mean, when, when Trump was elected in 2016, um, and I, you know, I was prime minister of Australia, I discussed <clears throat> the likely, you know, the Trump uh, presidency with many leaders you know, from Xi Jinping to, you know, a, a dozen, at least a dozen world leaders. And the, the view at that time was, oh, well, he said all these wild things on the campaign trail, but once he gets into office, he'll be institutionalised. You know, it'll become more conventional. People used to quote uh, that line of Mario Cuomo's, you know, we campaign in poetry, but we govern in prose. Well, mm -hmm. um, as Michelle Bachelet from Chile mm -hmm. said, there wasn't a lot of poetry in the 2016 campaign. But what uh, Trump in office proved was that he was as wild in office as he was on the campaign trail. So mm -hmm. now we're faced with a really unpredictable uh, prospect and a guy who is hell-bent, so he says, out of his own lips, right. on, you know, taking revenge on his opponents and his critics. And... You know, it, it is. It, it's a. It, it's. It's. A, it's going to be. Look, there isn't a. There isn't a uh, foreign commentator, foreign policy commentator, 
in the world that isn't writing up the prospect of a Trump presidency as a major risk to global security. So what I'm saying to you <clears throat> is effectively a penetrating glimpse of the obvious. I mean, Trump is a threat to global security because he essentially presents himself as being a threat to the established order. Former Prime